Joining us for this week's roundtable is Scott Ferris, an author, art historian, and scholar of American and Adirondack artist Rockwell Kent. Welcome, it's nice to Thank have you here. Thank you very much. You live on the other side, the western edge of the Adirondack Park in Boonville, New York, a small community Correct. just north of, of Utica. But you're uh, certainly familiar with this side. You attended Plattsburgh State, and yeah. then you also worked at the Art Gallery at Plattsburgh State at SUNY Plattsburgh, mm -hmm. which is dedicated to Rockwell Kent. So you, you yeah. certainly know this area. Your career, for all intents and purposes, really started here. Sure, and I, I went from the Kent Gallery at Plattsburgh State to the Kent Estate to work for Kent's widow for two years, 1980 to 1982. For those who don't know, the, the gallery at SUNY Plattsburgh is one of the most complete collections of Kent anywhere. It, they certainly have a lot of material. It's very representative of Kent's life and work. Um, he did so much stuff that you could fill it again with, with more stuff. And when you <laughs> say that, and, and you shrug your shoulders, but it really is true. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with his, with his work, he, uh, they may know him as a painter, they may know him as the, as the illustrator, uh, illustrating a number of famous works, including Moby Dick, but he truly was a remarkable artist in, in, his, in his scope of, of, of talent. Yes. He, he most certainly was. He was probably one of the most prolific artists of all times. The amount of material that he could produce, the variety of media that he worked in, um, he was just an amazing man. Uh, some people refer to him as a Renaissance man, and I suppose in the 20th century that would still be applicable. And for people who didn't know him, a lot were introduced to him four years ago the New York State Museum had an exhibition, mm -hmm. and they included a wide variety of works, not only his famous paintings and his illustrations, but, but wood carvings and, and dinnerware. And, and I think a lot of people were surprised to, to learn uh, what he had, had done through his career. Sure, and a lot of that material, most of the material for that exhibition came from Plattsburgh State, from the Kent Collection. And you're right, they filled up their exhibition space with lots of material, and it, again, you could fill it 10 times more beyond that with just the, the breadth and the depth of the material that he produced. And you just wrapped up a show at uh, St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, at yes. uh, the Brush Art Gallery, and that ran through the end of the year. Um, you were the guest curator for that? Right, I was guest curator for the exhibition at the Brush Gallery, but we had a, another exhibit at the O&D Young Library, also on campus, and that dealt mostly with the um, book and the written materials. Um, back in January, a year ago this month, they had a, um, a purchase of quite a lot of Kent material, uh, wood engravings, lithographs, uh, books, and then the special collections curator, he acquired a large collection of Kent's letters with his uh, second wife, Frances, and her sister, Kendall, and it deals with North Country materials. It uh, deals with uh, work at Asgard Farm. But the uh, gallery, the Brush Art Gallery, also uh, was in on this purchase and acquired a number of prints and a drawing for a Vanguard record jacket. And so that, um, that exhibition was comprised of that material, plus some material that I had lent to them, plus uh, borrowing paintings, some very important paintings from different parts of the country. So they were showing off their new edition yes. uh, the, 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 to their collection. Uh, at the same time, was this sort of a, 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 a reintroduction to, to Rockwell Kent for a lot of people? Well, yes. I. <laughs> I liken it to going to a concert. You have a, a band that goes out traveling around the country doing shows every night for weeks on end, and they're doing the same material or related material. They do it a little bit differently from city to city, but it's, it's them. So in this case, you have a, um, there are a number of items in the show that people had not seen before, for sure but there were some common items. They might have seen them in books or maybe even in person. And 
So it's, um, it was a new way of introducing a new body of people, a new generation actually, because the, the gallery and the library are focused, of course, on the students and the faculty at St. Lawrence, at Potsdam, at Clarkson, um, at the schools in that area. And then it branches out, as we discovered when I gave an opening talk, there were a lot of locals that showed up people that would have known Kent um, while he still lived in the area, and then some of their children. I, one of the images that I showed was a picture of um, some of his farmer unions associates in the North Country here, and one of the daughters of one of the individual's pictures came up and said, where did you get that image from? And she said, "That's on the that was taken on our front porch. And so there is definitely a personal connection in the North Country to Rockwell Kent. Um, he spent a lot of his life here, and so it's understandable. And you mentioned that many of his, his, his neighbors, the people who lived in the community, uh, you know, Sable Forks and around Asgard, and really throughout the, the Adirondack Park certainly knew of him. At times it was a contentious relationship, though. He, he was, uh, he was uh, an individual who uh, was... Uh, uh, a, a labor leader, uh, very progressive politically, uh, a socialist, and, and that probably ruffled a number of feathers for a number of years with his neighbors. Yeah, it, it did very much so, and Kent was an, an in-your-face sort of person. He had no qualms about making it clear to you what was on his mind. And um, one of the people in that photograph that I just mentioned, he actually lived down in my area uh, before he passed away. He was also a farmer and part of this union. And after a talk that I gave down in the Utica area, um, some people were asking me questions in the audience. And um, he was there and I said, well, I, I never knew Rockwell. I never met him in person. I know him well, but I don't know him on a personal level. And so um, I asked Al to stand up and answer some questions. And they said, say, well, what was Rockwell Kent like? And so Al said, he knew everything. <laughs> and I mean, he just belted out. It was like this pent up resentment that this, this guy always had to be on yeah. top of the argument. Well, there were a number of reasons why any of us feel like we need to be on top of an argument. And, one is um, your, your knowledge, and then your desire to get your point across. And, and Kent was very knowledgeable, and he was very forceful in and making getting his, his point, point across. For those of us who never met him, uh, there is an old clip of him from outside the Supreme Court, where yes. back during the McCarthy era and during the, the, the uh, hearings mm -hmm. into uh, allegations of people being communists, he got caught up in that. His yeah. passport was taken away, revoked. And he went to the Supreme Court to get it back. And I think you saw what you were just describing mm -hmm. outside uh, with CBS. I believe he did yes. an interview where mm -hmm. he had talked to the, he had come to the Supreme Court to uh, to get his passport uh, put back in good standing. And I think he used the analogy of uh, somebody taking his pants away, and and he went outside and told yes. the Supreme Court he was coming to get his pants back. Yes, he said if. Um, if my wife didn't want me to go out and she took my pants away, I'd want my pants back. <laughs> so yes, he was very forceful. And I, I think that. you could see uh, his, his strong personality coming through in, in that interview. But Af also, you, uh, sorry no, to interrupt ahead. you, but also um, what you saw in that interview and what you would have seen even in his exchange with Al Kushler would have been humor. He was forceful but he was also patting you back on the same, at the same time. Which, so he, sure, he was very solid in his commitments and very forceful, but um, he was also a very humorous man right from the, the very earliest days. After that period, after he got his passport back, mm -hmm. he uh, angered a number of people. Um, they, they thought he was being defiant when he went to the Soviet Union and embraced the Soviet people. He gave them uh, a number of his works, uh, yes. and uh, probably people who were turned off by him before, or, or if he ruffled their feathers, so to speak, uh, probably during the height of the Cold, Cold War weren't thrilled to see that. Uh, no, he, um, that was his way of jabbing, 
jabbing back at people that uh, he felt wronged him. Um, and there are a number of cases that I could bring to the fore. But in that specific case, he had already been to the Soviet Union. He had already corresponded mm -hmm. with folks in the Soviet Union, not just uh, political people, but artists as well. So it wasn't new, but he, right. it was a defiant, in-your-face type. Right. And the reason why it was so defiant was he, um, he won the U.S. Supreme Court passport case in June, I think, of 58. And by July or August, he and Sally were out of town. They were overseas. They said, there's a chance that this could be appealed. So we're, we're heading out of town. So he, he did go. He caught up with an exhibition of his work, a major exhibition of his work that um, showed that the people of the Soviet Union embraced him and his artwork, that it wasn't completely political, although there was a heavy dose of that as well. Um, so he said, well, these folks are, um, there are more people that have seen my work during this exhibition of five cities in 57 and 58 that um, I will give them my uh, collection of my work. And this was work that was going to go, he had hoped, to, the, um, to Maine, to the Farnsworth um, in 1953. And then what happened was there was this uh, meeting between Kent and McCarthy, the usual sort of, um, uh, Joe McCarthy, this usual sort of meets with people that Mark McCarthy uh, was trying to bury, mm -hmm. and Kent wasn't going to put up with that. But the result of that was that the gift did not end up going to Maine. It ended up going across the pond, and that was unfortunate. But Kent uh, went back in 1960, dedicated the gift, um, and he had returned to the Soviet Union several times during the, the 60s, up close to his death. He died in, early, in the early 71. 1970s. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Maine. Uh, you were in Maine this past summer. We yes. caught up with you there. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a show of works by Kent uh, by a well, another well-known artist, Jamie Wyeth, who mm -hmm. of course is the son of Andrew Wyeth. Mm -hmm. and, and that was from an era when Kent lived on Monhegan Island, which is an artist colony, or it was back in its day. And uh, Kent and many other well-known artists were, sure. were there together back in the early 1900s. And sure. that's where he did some of his most famous works. Yes, definitely. Um, that's, Kent went to Monhegan basically on a strong suggestion of his mentor, Robert Henry, who was a, um, a major art teacher and painter the early part of the 20th century, latter part of the 19th century. And um, among his students were not just Kent, but also Edward Hopper and George Bellows, uh, very prominent names in the art world mm -hmm. today. Um, and so Kent, based on Henry's description, decided he wanted to go to Monhegan. He did, he fell in love with it. And he not only got to work as a, a painter and a, a drawer of sorts, but um, he wanted to, he was coming of age in, in, on Monhegan. And so his way of doing that was to uh, put into physical form uh, what he had read and what his uh, developing philosophy was telling him to do. And that was to engage with the worker and develop these early Debsian socialist views and in doing so, Monhegan was ideal in all respects. It was a painter's paradise and since that uh, original small group of uh, early 20th century American artists uh, spread the word through their artwork and through their uh, writings, through their chatter about the island, um, you not only had that crew and that part of Kent's life that he was satisfying, but you also had Kent's interest in labor and um, becoming one with the earth, one with the labor, the salt of the earth. And um, when Hagen was perfect, so he could uh, use his architectural training to uh, work on building houses. He would be a fisherman. He would dig privies, um, whatever was required. So he was really um, the first artist 
to, to go and live with the people on a year-round basis. He wasn't a Sunday school painter that was just going to go out on sunny days. He was um, dressed up in those hardened, oil-skinned uh, fishing outfits, and he'd go out there to capture the lobster, and um, he would get out there to paint in storms. Um, and he built his own house? He built his house. He built a house for his mother. He worked on the, the twin houses. Um, he did maybe a half a dozen buildings. And that's the connection to Jamie Wyeth. Jamie Wyeth, not only uh, a painter in his own right, but he mm -hmm. bought Kent's house on, on Monhegan Island. So that, he, that was the first uh, connection. And then through the years, he's been buying uh, Kent Works. Yes, but um, Jamie bought the house that Kent built for his mother. And one day when I was out there cataloging some of these paintings that uh, Jamie had acquired, um, his workmen happened to be out on the porch rebuilding some of the structures, some of the posts on the porch. And he said, Scott, take a look at this. No wonder uh, Kent was sure that the house would stand. He's got internal supports just for this post on the, uh, the porch. And at the time that Kent was building it, he did heed the call of the, the uh, neighbors in one cent and it frightened him enough to, um, to double everything up mm. to reinforce everything. That probably doesn't surprise you, him being uh, that meticulous. No. I mean, if you're, there's always a need to back up what you're, you're doing. And, and Kent, um, if it was building a house, then uh, under the circumstances, if it needed to be fortified, it got fortified. You spoke at the opening of the exhibit this, this summer in, in Maine. I did. And that exhibit is, is, is traveling. It was in Philadelphia, and it's, it's uh, heading to the Carolinas in, in the coming months. It, is this uh, <coughs> show uh, introducing Kent to a, to a whole new audience? Um, I would say yes. They are not unfamiliar with Kent in Greenville, South Carolina, any more than they are at the Brandywine Museum, because they did do a Kent show there recently also. Mm. But um, this show is, is different because it's a, a juxtaposition of Kent's work and Jamie's work. Mm -hmm. And um, so every time a, an exhibition like a, a, a band travels around the country, they are reinduce, reintroducing themselves, or in the case of Kent's work, reinduce, reintroducing Kent's work to a new public. So some people are, are going to have seen some of this material before, most likely in books or catalogs. Um, now they'll be able to see it in the canvas, so to speak. And um, it's not just folks that have been around for a long time that have had an interest in Kent, but also uh, these new generations that we've already mentioned. Um, that's why it's important to keep doing um, exhibitions, excuse me, keep doing uh, books, keep doing television programs, because there is a new audience out there every single day uh, that want to grab onto this kind of information, learn something new. You can't see everything all the time, and so if you just keep it circulating, um, and in Kent's case, it's very easy because you can always put out something that somebody hasn't seen. And you're speaking at the uh, exhibition in, in Greenville, South Carolina. Yes. That's opening in late February and running for several weeks or months. Yes. And I will speak on the, the 3rd of March. And this past summer in Kent's hometown of Osable Forks, the Tahaz uh, Lodge Gallery, Mm -hmm. uh, had an exhibit, <coughs> uh, part of the collection by Ralph Nemec, and that mm -hmm. showed a number of Kent's works. As time has gone on, nearly 40 years now after his death, you mentioned the new generation that's appreciating him. Are many of the people who did know him and, and uh, are, are part of the older generation, is there sort of a newfound respect or admiration for Kent as, as time goes on? Uh, respect, admiration, I'd also throw in curiosity. Because you, you may know someone as a neighbor, but you may not know that he illustrated Beowulf. You know, you know he illustrated Moby Dick. Mm. He did Beowulf. He did Canterbury Tales. Um, so people so are constantly surprised by, by what, he's, what he did through his career. 
I'm constantly surprised. I'm, that's the one thing that helps me stick with the project is that I'm always finding new things. They aren't new. They've been out there for decades. Obviously, as you point out, he's been dead for nearly four decades, and um, the just the amount of material that. But you're he discovering produced. new work yes. all the time. And if I'm discovering new work, and I have thousands of items myself, just imagine what our our neighbors are are seeing for the very first time, and it's refreshing because they get to see material that's completely different. The old thought that Kent always did the same thing is so untrue. And the only way you see that is you go to see the collection at Plattsburgh State. You go to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and look at the Zagrosser collection. You go to Bowdoin College and you see the collection up there. And just every place you go and you think you've seen enough, go to the Archives of American Art or go online and, and read through the papers. And the amount of materials is seemingly endless. It's, it's a joy. And it, what Kent is very good at, in a retrospective view, is that he was quite literally an index to 20th century world history. And I use history as a basic term because it encompasses art as well as history. It's, sociopolitical, it's abstract art, it's um, modernism, it's all these terms that you want to throw out. Um, and one of the things that I, t I knew and I just um, kind of learned it again recently was, as Kent had said in um, an interview with John Wingates in the 1950s, he said very defiantly, I am not a conformist, um, and that's, that's a direct quote, and the reason why that came to mind to me was because I, at the talk at uh, St. Lawrence University, most of what I did was read from a, a pamphlet he wrote that's called What is an American? And in, in the closing sentence, he says, um, you know, after all these things about equality and rights and such, you know, what's, what I choose is communism. And I said, well, no, you don't. I've, I've read This Is My Own, his book about his life in the Adirondacks up to 1940. Mm -hmm. And there you point out in excruciating detail exactly what your thoughts are on the political realm, right down to the, the fine point. And you state that you are, your belief, your uh, political belief, so to speak, is socialism, mm -hmm. and there, there is a difference. But um, you're also following, when you're writing what is an American, you're following what people are responding to and what um, our changes in definitions and our ideas of, of what things mean, and we could go into innumerable words even today that apply. but. Basically, when he is saying communism, he's, he's saying socialism. Mm. It's, it's just another ism. So when he interviews with John Wingate, and he says, I'm not a conformist, and I never was and never have been, never will be, cannot conceive of being a communist, um, he is saying that I'm not a conformist. Take the ist off my name. Take the ism out of my uh, philosophical beliefs. I know what I believe. You want to change the word, all right, I'll throw this word, your word, back at you. Now chew on that. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. So you're still amazed today by, by this man who you started studying 30, 35 years ago. I am, I'm amazed by him, but I'd, I don't, put Kent on a high pedestal. After I read his autobiography, It's Me, O Lord, I said, what a bleep and <laughs> 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 what a horse's patoot. I but said, a talented I, one. But a talented one. And I, I said, you know, part of our problem with uh, our thoughts on isms or our thoughts on people or mm. whatever the case may be is that we have a tendency to say, oh, 
he's the best artist of all, or um, he's the best singer of all, or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. And if you live in a small box, then that may very well be true. Kent didn't live in a box. I don't live in a box. I'm on the road all the time. Mm. Um, and no, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm seeing things new all the time. Uh, Kent is just one of those uh, people that I know indirectly, that I know quite thoroughly. Uh, but I don't know everything about him. I never met him. He wasn't a friend of mine. Mm. Um, so I don't put him on the, the high rung of a ladder. You know, there are, if you want to talk about artists, I love Peter Bruegel the Elder. I love Da Vinci. Um, I even like uh, Mark Rothko. But then you start getting down into specifics. And there are some works by Kent that I think are terrible. And there are other works that I'm just in awe of. But I guess overall regarding Kent, um, I do share a similar uh, socio-political belief uh, philosophy that, that he held. And it's not because of him. It's just because of the way I grew up, the environment, uh, my travels. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think Kent should be admired. I think that he should be critically reviewed every single generation, as we do with all artists. And just weed out for our time what we think is the best and what we think is, is mediocre. And, and place that person in um, the realm that we all should be placed in, is our good, our bad, our indifferent. And you mentioned the new generation, the new audience. Is the Wyeth exhibition continuing to travel and are there others planned for the next few years where people will get a chance to, to see uh, Rockwell Kent's work? Well, I think this show of uh, Jamie's collection of his work and uh, Rockwell's work um, was going to go to Farnsworth, the Brandywine, the uh, Greenville County uh -huh. Museum of so Art. So this is the last stop for that? Um, it may very well be. Um, but moments ago, you had mentioned Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know if you were referring to the Brandywine, which is near Philadelphia, but it, it's not in the same community. Um, but I didn't also know if you were referring to the exhibition that was at the Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, last year. Um, and I bring that up because uh, you said, are people going to get a chance to see his work? Well, last year you had the Philadelphia Museum of Art show. You had the Bennington Museum mm -hmm. of Art show in, in Vermont. Yes. You had my exhibition at um, St. Lawrence. Saint Lawrence. Um, you had uh, Ralph Nemec's exhibition, I'll Save Old Forks. You have um, the exhibitions that are t opening up at uh, in Winona, Minnesota, as we speak, there is a community-wide celebration on the 100th anniversary of Kent's stay and work in Winona, Minnesota in 1912. Um, mm. So these works of uh, Jamie's and uh, Rockwell's will go back into the closet and something else will develop. Um, in fact, I'd, I think it's the Farnsworth that is doing another show that in also includes some Kent material. But shows are always going on. You'd, and these, there are t uh, two or three shows on socio-political work mm -hmm. that are traveling around the country right now, and they include some work by Kent. Um, so it's not difficult to find an active Kent show. And if you have difficulty finding an active Kent show, you certainly don't have uh, difficulty finding a museum that um, has some Kent's works. And people should remember that, uh, or they should think of artwork that is in museums and galleries as, as artwork that we own. I mean, we own the, the artwork at Plattsburgh State. Um, the people in Philadelphia own the artwork in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Some of their taxes go to supporting that. So they should um, ask the folks that work at these various institutions to see the work. If it's not on display, 
um, there should not be an argument about, okay, we have a curator or a registrar that can take you into storage to s see this work. Um, and that's one thing that Kent wanted. That's why he was so happy about the turnout at the five-city exhibition tour in 57 and 58 in the Soviet Union. He was just ecstatic that these hundreds of thousands of people came to see his work. Mm -hmm. He had no interest in things being locked up. And um, part of the reason why the um, Kent Gallery exists here at Plattsburgh State is perhaps because of a little brawl that was going on in the late 60s about showing Kent's work um, on the campus. And um, George Angel, the president then, he was a friend of Kent. He was interested in having the work shown. I believe that that exhibition was booed out, but it was because of that friendship with George Angel and Rockwell Kent that after both of their deaths, I believe, um, Sally followed up on Kent's interest and um, gave the artwork to Plattsburgh State in the 1970s. I believe at first it came in 74, was dedicated in 78. And to come full circle, that's where I come in, because the, the director, the new director at the time, Edward R. Broll, had asked me to catalog and label the collection. So um, come full circle, and we're back in Plattsburgh again, and we're talking about the uh, collection that George and Rockwell talked about back in the 60s. And not only do you like to see the exhibitions traveling the country, but as you said, uh, folks don't have to travel far to, to see uh, one of the largest collections, and that's right at Plattsburgh State. If they've never been there, they, they'll be uh, uh, quite amazed by, by visiting that museum. Certainly. And um, again, I'd reiterate the idea of going in, um, get an appointment, ask to see specific works. If you don't know the, what's there, um, go online. I think they have a lot of what they own up online, or at least uh, you get a sense of what's there. And just say you're interested in seeing a certain body of work. Don't do it just at Plattsburgh. Do it um, in New York. Do it in Denver, wherever the, the wherever artwork may are. be. Take the time to give yourself a treat. And don't just do it with Rockwell Ken. If there's another artist you're interested in, by all means, get out to these museums and galleries and, and see the work. Pursue it. Give yourself a, a treat. Well, Scott Ferris, we're glad that we could bring you back to Plattsburgh where, where it all started for you. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.